Welcome back, Microeconomists. Today we are still in Chapter 1, looking at the five foundations of economics. Be sure to turn the subtitles on in case the homework password is hidden down there. Or it could be in some other video. Just kind of watch all the videos and make sure the subtitles are on so you don't miss it. So last time we talked about the first foundation, which is incentives. Now moving on to foundation number two, which is trade-offs. So the tense developed parables is a story we often tell in principles of economics classes. It goes something like this. There was an ancient king who wanted to understand economics better so he could govern and make his kingdom richer. So what he did is he consulted with all of his economists and asked them to write a book with all of economic wisdom in it so he could read it and learn it. As you will gradually come to appreciate, economics can be some pretty complicated stuff. So when the economists went to work, they came back with a multi-volume series on economics. The king took one look at that big stack of books and said, that's too long, make it shorter. So the economists went back to work and they cut a lot of stuff out and they brought it down to one volume. The king said, still too long, I'm really busy with a lot of other stuff, so make it even shorter. They brought it down to a pamphlet, but the king said, that's still too long. I want you to bring it down to just a single sentence. A daunting task indeed. What does the economist came up with? They realized that most fundamentally, economics is about trade-offs and about scarcity. So he wanted to try to summarize all of economic wisdom into one normal length sentence. It would be this. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. You don't get something for nothing in economics land. It doesn't work that way when there's scarcity and when there is trade-offs. So that's what tense to stairs stands for. So the T is for there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. So the parable really illustrates how central trade-offs are to economics. That's why they're among our five foundations. So one trade-off that we often talk about is what we call the guns and butter trade-off. It's not necessarily literally about guns and butter, rather guns is a synecdoche for all military goods. Butters are presenting all domestic goods. So if you invest really heavily in your military, that's going to deprive the civilians of resources which can bring down their quality of life. You look at North Korea, which has a very strong military and also a tremendous amount of poverty. On the other hand, if you deprive your military and really give a lot of goods to your civilians, then your country could easily become conquered or could lose a war. So it's a trade-off, some kind of balance you got to try to reach. So one illustration out of many, I found this poster from World War I. They're encouraging people at home to cut back on their consumption of wheat and meat, and that could free up resources for the military. The troops could then be well-fed and well-supplied so they could go and win the war. So trying to feed everyone at home really well and trying to feed the military also really well was just not possible at the time. There's a trade-off to be made. So that's our second foundation. Because you probably already know something about trade-offs, I kept that one pretty short. Our third foundation is probably a new one to you. That's one's called opportunity cost. You know what the word opportunity already, and you know what costs are, but you might not have heard them together. So let's spend some more time on this one. First of all, our definition. Opportunity cost is the highest value alternative that must be sacrificed in order to get something else. Now, one thing we'll realize in this section here is that many things that might appear to be free actually have a hidden cost tied to them. Oftentimes, when you commit to one course of action, that's going to mean you're not doing something else instead. 
So let's try to raise your awareness of these hidden costs. Here's one example that you guys would find relevant. The cost of going to college. When you talk about the cost of going to college, you're probably thinking about it costs a lot of money for tuition, it costs a lot of money for my dorm or my apartment, it costs a lot of money for food. However, that kind of stuff is actually not the number one cost of college. The biggest cost from going to college is actually the opportunity cost. So what's the highest vital alternative that you're sacrificing when you're going to college? Well, if you weren't in school, what would you be doing instead? You'd be working full time. If you work full time, you could be earning wages and a salary. So when you're going to class here, you're sacrificing all that money you could have been earning instead from a full time job. Now, perhaps some of you are working part time. So maybe you're thinking that opportunity cost does not apply to you. That's actually not true. You can work part time and go to college, but if you weren't taking classes, you could be working more hours. You could be working full time instead of part time. So you're still making a sacrifice. You're still an opportunity cost when you're going to class. Here's a quick numerical illustration. These numbers were roughly true to the time when I was making these slides, which is back in summer of 2015. Numbers may have gone up a little bit since then, but the general impression is still accurate. So back when I was at University of Oregon for grad school, undergrad tuition and fees were around 10,000 per year. It's probably bigger than now. If you had to get a full-time job, I'm guessing your salary would be 20 grand per year. How I got that number? Let's say you get $10 per hour. Typical work week of full-time is 40 hours per week. And they're roughly, to round a little bit, 50 weeks in a year. So 10 times 40 times 50 works out to 20,000. So anyways, I got those numbers in place. The big question is, what is the cost for a student to go to college? So before I took this class, you're probably thinking, well, the cost of going to college was 10,000 per year because that's what tuition and fees are. If you'd asked an economist the same question, given them the same data, they would have told you 30,000. That's not a mistake. That's because the economist figures the cost is the tuition and fees. Uh, should be tuition and fees, not in fees. Tuition and fees are 10,000, but the economist also says you're sacrificing $20,000 you could have earned from a full-time job. So the economic cost of going to college in total is going to be 10,000 plus 20,000, which works out to a total of $30,000. Now, of course, going to college could boost your future earnings, so it could still be worthwhile. However, I don't want you to have any illusions about what the real cost of going to college is. An idea that's always popular among college students is free college. Wonder why that is, but if you make college tuition free and even had no fees, going to college would still be costly. There would still be this opportunity cost of the wages you're sacrificing. All right, here's another example. So let's say Robert wants to start a new business. He did some math and he figured he needs to have $10,000 in order to get his business off the ground. He had to buy supplies, he had to rent out a storefront, get equipment, that kind of stuff. And that's going to cost him $10,000. So now he has to figure out where is that ten grand going to come from? He could take out a loan or he could take the money out of his savings account. So the guy bases off in real life. He is quite enthusiastic, quite enthusiastic about entrepreneurship, and he's also pretty good about savings. So he could actually have $10,000 in his savings account quite plausibly. So some relevant figures. His savings are getting 5% per year at the bank. If he were to get a loan from the bank, they would charge him 2% interest. Now, 
but Robert I know in real life is highly averse to debt, so I could actually see him making this decision in the following way. He might say that, I'll take the money out of my savings account because I don't want to pay the bank any interest. So, my question for you guys, are there any opportunity costs that he should consider? So, I'll do this quite often throughout the semester. I'll put a question up on the slides and I'll invite you to pause the video and think about it. Once you think you've got the answer, then press play and I'll go over it. So go ahead and pause the video here and give this question some thought. All right, I've assumed you have come to your conclusion by now. So the answer is yes, there is a big opportunity cost that he should have been thinking about. So if you take the money out of your savings account, you're giving up that 5% interest that you could have been earning instead. So yeah, you avoided 2% interest in the bank. You're not paying them 2%, but you're also avoiding getting paid 5%. And 5% is bigger than 2%. So the opportunity cost, that lost 5% interest, is actually bigger than the 2% you could be paying the bank instead. So actually, you're better off taking out a loan from the bank and going into debt. You can keep that money in your savings account and keep earning that 5% interest, and that's better. So that opportunity cost is a hidden cost because you're not paying the bank. You might think you're avoiding any extra cost, but you're not. So like I said before, I'm trying to boost your awareness of these hidden costs so you make the right decisions. Here's another example. So let's say Robert is persuaded by this logic and he's going to take out a loan instead of taking money out of his savings account. He also comes to realize that economics might not be quite so straightforward as he might have initially realized. So he's going to hire one of my top students in the past, Joseph, to help him out. I mean, if you're a star in this class, you got to put in your name over here instead. Something to aspire to an incentive to do well. So anyways, Joseph's going to advise Robert, and after a year of doing business together, they have this conversation about how things went. So Robert, I'll just call him RP over here at Save Some Space, says, I'm so glad that I quit my job to start this business. I paid back that loan from the bank and earned $30,000 in profit. So now Joseph asks him a question that, might appear kind of off topic. Joseph asks, how much were you earning from the job before you quit? Robert replies, 70,000 per year. So now Joseph has already asked a rather odd question, says something that sounds even odder. He says, actually your economic profit was negative. Your profit was negative 40,000. So even though the real life Joseph is based in Oregon, um, he was not high on pot. You know, they're famous for legalizing marijuana at a relatively early date. He was not high when he said this. There was some real logic behind why Joseph said economic profit was minus 40,000. So go ahead and pause the video here and try to figure out what was going on in Joseph's head when he said that. Why can Joseph say that? All right, I'll assume you've given us some thought and you've worked out an answer. So what Joseph was thinking about was the opportunity cost. In order to start a new business, Robert had to walk away from his old job and walk away from that old salary he was getting before. So when he did that, he was sacrificing a salary of 70,000 per year. That was Robert's opportunity cost when he started his business. So when he realized that, you also see that Joseph's question here about how to earn from the old job is actually quite relevant. It's not off topic at all. Joseph was trying to calculate what's your opportunity cost when you started this business. And then once he had that in place, Joseph could calculate the economic profit. So it's the accounting problem, which is based on 
um, your dollar profit and dollar losses, all based on things that are tangible. But the cost also reckons in the opportunity cost. And that $3,000 accounting profit, once you take away that $70,000 opportunity cost, works out to minus 40000 In other words, Robert was $40,000 worse off from his new business than what it could have had if he kept his old job and kept earning 70000 instead. Now, maybe Robert's business will take off in the future and he'll be happy he did it, but based on year one alone, this business did not do well. By the way, new firms often don't do well in the first year. It can take quite a while to see a positive return, so this might not really be a shock. So we're not saying it was a bad idea to go into business, but just based on year one alone, based on only that data, it looks like things did not go very well. All right, that wraps up foundation number three on opportunity costs. Be sure to come in for our next episode in which we'll learn about the fourth foundation, marginal thinking.